to survive the fiery heat of entry. The inflatable technology is still in its early stages of development. However, I believe that this is a breakthrough technology and the future belongs to it. But not everyone agrees. There's a surprising amount of resistance to inflatables in the conservative aerospace community because they don't have that much experience with it and they can't point to the designs they've used for the last 30 years. But I was literally walking down the, the, the hall at JPL once and, and uh, you know, talking to some guy and he said, oh, right, like, you want to go to Mars in a balloon? And I said, hey, hang on a second. If that balloon is made out of the same stuff that keeps cops alive when they get shot by a high-caliber bullet, you know, then yes, I do want to go to Mars in a balloon. Glenn Brown, president of Vertigo Aerospace, believes his inflatables are tough enough to land on Mars. The kinds of strength and stiffness that we estimate are necessary for even the 60-ton landers are achievable with this type of structure that we're building today. Its strength is related to pressure when you think of inflatables. And so if you took an air mattress and just kept pumping more air in it, it would swell up and grow until it finally burst. We take the same thing in a way and we wrap fibers around it. So this beam that I'm standing next to here, for instance, uh, is inflated to uh, 60 PSI. It's about twice what the tires on your car would be inflated to. Another good thing about this type of structure is that it's very difficult to actually break. A structure like this can be designed, and we in fact do design them, to be able to take an overload, and when that overload is released, to pop back. So you really can't break them in the normal sense. Strong enough and heat resistant. Thanks to inflatable technology, the crew will be able to survive the first two minutes of those six minutes of terror. With the air shell gone, they are still blazing through the Martian atmosphere six times faster than a Formula One race car. They'll need to put the brakes on fast. And now, the biggest threat is one the crew can't see. NASA calls landing on Mars the six minutes of terror. So far, the lander has survived the fiery temperatures of entry, but now it's just four minutes from impact. Two, one. Traveling at over 18,000 kilometers an hour, the crew needs to slow the capsule down in a hurry. But here, the Martian atmosphere, or lack of it, creates a whole new set of problems. With unmanned probes during the descent stage, engineers have traditionally used parachutes to control the speed as the lander approaches the Martian surface. When you take humans and the food and water and, and auxiliary equipment to keep a habitable space for humans, when you take that to Mars, the vehicle gets so heavy that we have to make parachutes that are as big as the Rose Bowl Coliseum here in Pasadena. They're absolutely huge in diameter, bigger than anything made by human race ever. Mars has only 1% of Earth's atmosphere. Even the peak of Mount Everest has 30 times more atmosphere. And that's not all. The Mars winds are cyclonic at times. They include dust, abrasive dust. They include chemistry we don't fully understand yet. So an impossibly thin atmosphere, plus the risk of winds, double the speed of a Category 5 hurricane. Hardly ideal conditions to attempt a landing with a precious human cargo. We've come in on, in this aero shell and we've taken out 99% of the kinetic energy. The next 1% of kinetic energy is taken out by typically a parachute system. That increases our drag. We open up a parachute, we, we increase the drag force or the, or the aerodynamic forces that slow us down. The danger typically in those systems is that the parachute won't open right, correctly, or it will break when it opens. Either of those is certain death. On Mars, the parachute has to open at speeds over 1,400 kilometers an hour. 
but some of the same stresses can be replicated at a much slower speed in Earth's denser atmosphere. Even without the Martian hazards, the test results aren't good. We may choose to try and skirt that problem by giving up the parachute part of descent and going straight to using our rocket engines and our propulsion system. Leonid Gorshkov at Russia's Energia Space Corporation has already made his decision. Parachutes are just too risky. I fervently believe that the spacecraft should not have to undergo any changes during that critical window. Nothing should be unfurled, inflated, it should land in the same state as it was launched. With no parachute to slow them down, the Russian crew will have to fire their descent engines much sooner. But that decision comes with a penalty. Now you're talking about carrying a lot more fuel for the descent engine. Well, if you're carrying a lot more fuel, then you've had to uh, expend a lot more energy on Earth to get that whole thing to Mars. And of course, there's probably less science payload on board the vehicle. Maybe, in fact, all that extra fuel has had to leave one or two astronauts in Mars orbit. Russia has good reason to be cautious. 80% of its unmanned missions to Mars have failed. Mars has been a planet of peril for landing robotic space vehicles. And all of us have experienced failures, from the European colleagues to the Russian colleagues to the Americans. Back in 1999, NASA lost two probes uh, en route to Mars. One was the polar lander, the other was the climate observer. Due to some very poor mathematics between two teams of NASA engineers, they thought the spacecraft was hitting the, the Mars interface at about 130 kilometers. It actually hit the Mars interface at about 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers, burnt up in the atmosphere and crashed into the planets. They just didn't know the difference between metric and imperial units of measurement. Not good. And this time, there will be lives on the line. So mistakes will be fatal. Those last few minutes, as we come out of hypersonic types of flight into subsonic safe landings, is where there's so many free variables. It's that final slam on the brakes, and now you're safely nestled on this beautiful Mars landscape. As if things weren't complicated enough, their habitat and supplies will have been sent in advance. So if the lander doesn't hit a precise target, the crew will be stranded. Unable to pick a landing location due to dust! If you're coming in, you've got to hit that, that landing ellipse, they call it. And if you've got stuff already on the surface of Mars, you've got to land right by it. If you don't land near that stuff, you're not coming home. Landing on Mars is a complex, three-stage process. So far, the astronauts have survived the searing heat of entry and maneuvered the lander through the killer winds during descent. Now they have just 90 seconds to find a safe place to land. Fire the rockets! Firing rockets! But where exactly is that? In August 2005, NASA launched the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Part of its mission is to take high-resolution images of the planet. These photos will help locate landing sites for future Mars missions. 